so, you all hear me all right? Great, great, good stuff. Um, well, what a bold day in Brighton so far, right? Huh? So, um, hope we can keep this up, because between us, we've probably got about half an hour just to fix the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it won't be easy. So, when Louise asked me to come and speak here um, you know, last year, I was quite excited by that. And it'd be really easy for me to say to you, go and buy Zay 2 and it's awesome. <laughs> you know? and, it, and you can see it in shops and stuff. But that's not really what the meaning's about. It's about engagement. And so much of the themes today have been about that engagement. We're hearing, we're hearing it today. I'm, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey to plant some seeds. And it won't be easy, um, but it will have meaning. And we're at the meaning conference today. And we're at a business conference. I, I asked Louise yesterday, does she see this as a, as a, as a, as a business conference? And, I, I, and she said, yeah. And I was like, pleased to hear that. Because business needs to have engagement, but it needs to have trade justice. And we just saw a brilliant talk about mobile phones, technologies that are exploitive, but trade justice is happening. And they're able to connect us to the technologies. But more than that, they're able to connect us to people. So before I do too much, I just want to ask some questions as well. And I'm going to engage the room a little bit. And it's kind of how, and I'm going to tell you a journey and a story of how I got into this and how we, as we created the world's first fair trade certified olive oil. So can I get a show of hands how many people here have been to Palestine? Very few, wow. That's all right, that's okay. That may be understandable. Um, how many people here want to go? Good, a lot more, right? We take tours to Palestine, so you're really welcome to go and see it. Um, Zaytun is a trade justice company supporting Palestinians, but we can do that to a certain extent. We can't do more than you guys do every day by connecting to a products that you buy. And an excellent way of doing that is just come and see for yourself and come out to the West Bank and connect to the products that you're already buying. So how many of here, here, I suspect this is going to be a lot less, but how many people here have got used to trying Palestinian olive oil? Oh, very few, right? And that's, and that's okay. Well, it's not, <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but it's understandable. Everyone in this room has grown up, and you think about it, uh, it's going to sound like a religious rant for a second, but all of you have grown up understanding that Palestinian olive oil is in every religious textbook you've ever come across, right? Would that be fair? When you talk about anointing oil, you don't really talk about going to Greece. You go to Palestine. It's always been there. So when we started out this project, we were on a challenge to reconnect that story. Not a religious one, but the people behind that olive oil and those trees. And we were also facing wholesalers who were connecting to the idea of this and thought, this is bold. But would it work? And, you know, interesting. When did Palestinians start selling olive oil? And we were like, about 3,000 years ago. And that is the reality of it, that we are watching families, communities, livelihoods being destroyed and disconnected to such a point that here we're in a lovely place in Brighton and people just aren't used to it. They're not used to even thinking that it happens. But it's been happening all the time. In fact, it was the Romans. A different occupation, a few years later. But it was the Romans who took it from Palestine and sent it to their ports in Rome, in, in Greece, and in Spain. But it was in Syria and in Palestine where olive, grows, olive trees grew indigenously. 68% of Palestinians are connected to olive oil. And they, it is the biggest part of their income. It's very, very difficult for a lot of people in this room to connect to farming in that way or to understand how symbolic or how important a tree can be. It's very, very difficult. And it's really why we try to get people to come and see. We're really watching people not just as custodians of looking at their livelihoods, but they're also looking at their ancestry. And when those trees are destroyed, it changes their connection to the land and it feels an awful strong guilt of letting down communities that planted those trees to protect generations after them. We, and I got involved in this in 2001, um, a bit like some of you here, 
So I'm watching it on the news, a bit concerned, not really sure what I should do, mostly feeling a bit lost with it all. But I did feel that it just seems relentless, and nobody's really watching, and it's going on throughout my lifetime, and I wondered if it was ever going to change. So in 2001, I started to volunteer and go there, and I started working to support international groups, sometimes working in medicine support, helping ambulances get through checkpoints. Uh, I was a bit rubbish at that, actually, but, but, that was, but it's something that I thought was important to do. One of the things that really moved me um, was a couple of places. Nablus was one of them. It was a city that was under siege for 100 days. Um, I really can't explain that until you see it for yourselves. But when you watch a military occupation controlling a city and nothing can move for 100 days, where children cannot be near the windows, just simply having volunteers to come and play with kids can change the world. It's these little connections. What I didn't discover, or I didn't understand, was how important olive trees were. I got involved in picking olives, um, enjoying it too. <laughs> what I didn't get was how hard it is for Palestinians to access the olive groves. I, didn't, I grew up in a rough council state in London. I didn't taste olive oil until I was at university. I actually didn't know it was even healthy. <laughs> What I didn't also understand is how many families need this to access their olive groves and how hard it is. At the time I was there, there was over 220 checkpoints across the West Bank. That's incredible. Some of them are flying checkpoints that come overnight with bulldozers and boulders, and some of them are permanent. And they are across the West Bank and stopping families to be able to reach each other. And they're also stopping a lot of trade. And that was just in 2001. But the traditions of Palestinians was continuing. Sometimes we needed to call Israeli soldiers to be amongst the olive groves. I can't explain how weird that is, but we're calling an Israeli army to be there because they're armed settlers, and they want that land. And they are shooting, at times, across towards unarmed people picking the olive groves. Trees are getting burned. And sometimes we need the presence of internationals to be there to act as buffers. And that's really what we learn. It was tough. It was tough for me to watch emotionally. It was tough to know that I can have a passport and I can leave any time. You know, this can just be a pub story for another day. But this was the reality that people were really facing. For this lady, it was her last olive tree, as you can see. But prior to that, her husband had had a heart attack when they came to take the trees, and he passed away. This was about settlement construction, when they're building more settlements that are deemed illegal by international law, yet it continues, and it continues, and it continues. We don't see a change in that. Now, it would be really easy to say, well, let's just focus on that. But that doesn't really get us to why we're at the meeting, or why we're at a business conference, and why we're talking more about connections, about things we can do well. So, watching the land grabs was heartbreaking, and we were watching people risking their lives daily just to pick their trees. Now, this is a weird question, but for a lot of families to be able to access the olive groves, sometimes there were nearby settlements, and sometimes, in certain occasions, some settlers would take pot shots. Who in their right mind would go near their olive trees with their families to pick those trees if you knew you might get shot? Anyone? Right, but if I told you that you would lose your land, that a, a, a state court in Israel would deem that you're not using that land, that you've left it abandoned, that they will then allocate it to a nearby settlement, you would still pick it. You'd have to. And that's what we were seeing. I didn't know these things. Families were just picking their olives, not even able to sell it. That shocked the hell out of me. We saw three years of olive oil, really good olive oil, by the way. <laughs> we saw three years of it under people's houses, where people weren't able to trade with it at all. So we're like, why are you still picking it? And it's because if they don't, they'll lose it. They'll lose the land. So that's why we needed more internationals witnessing this, being part of it. None of the internationals I'd come across had ever come up with the idea of selling the oil, but everyone there was reacting to the occupation, the constant militarization, the fear of settler harassment would get stronger. But we never had a long-term plan. And uh, nor did I, really. In 2002, in picking the olives and getting to understand the intimacies of what was happening, 
we, the, the State of Israel really unveiled, uh, unveiled its plan to build what became the occupation wall. Are all of you aware of the wall, how big the wall is? Has anyone got an idea in kilometers, just roughly, what it might, how long it might be? Anyone? Okay. It's 722 kilometers long over a space that's not much more than 160 kilometers across. It goes through water supplies. It takes uh, medical support, and then you can see nearby settlements there. And this is not the border of the Green Line. You're not looking at the state of Israel there. You're looking at Palestine being cut in half, or a part of it, at least. It's heartbreaking to see, and people become familiar with some of the images that Banksy creates as well, which is a good thing, because uh, it gets people to understand what it is. But actually, to really understand what it is, is again to go there. But to have a think for a second, and it's a serious subject, but we're going to hopefully bring some positiveness to it. But if some of you here had a huge giant wall that big across, and you wouldn't see your families there. If some of you live in Ho, for example, and the wall is that big, and maybe you'll never see your family in Brighton, that would be a crime. It would be a terrible one. If you could never get permission to even go to London, maybe once a month, and you've got to apply, and you need medical support, and sometimes it's allowed and sometimes it's not, but when you're waiting for that medical permission, you're getting more sick. It's tough, but it's really happening. And we felt that, yeah, dividing families from each other, that's pretty painful. Not be, having families not being able to access the olive groves and support each other, to be able to pick their own olives safely, that's pretty painful. But actually, this is an economic strangulation. When you can't pick your trees and access your olive groves, and all of you are olive farmers, or all of you sell nuts, or all of you sell oranges, and you can't do it, poverty is being forced on you. It's not a discussion that the world can sit and wait and decide when there's peace and when there's justice. It's happening fast. So we felt that we needed to understand it more um, and really sort of engage on it. So we decided, instead of just picking the olives, we would come up with a plan to sell it. And, and we decided to unveil that great plan. <laughs> and um, I want to tell you that went smoothly. <laughs> I'll be lying. <laughs> um, this is a picture of, so we met with NGOs and decided to talk about this plan, that we were going to sell this olive oil in the UK, and we were going to bypass the wall. And we were going to work with communities to tell the story. And there were NGOs, uh, that were very big ones in, in Palestine, that thought that was brave, um, foolish, <laughs> but brave. And this, we decided to do it here. This was a village called Daristria. Um, some of you who've been to Palestine may have seen it. But that's an original, it's a thousand year old village, over a thousand, that's the original Byzantine dome. And that's why I like being there, because it has that history. It's not trapped in looking at its context or its existence just in 70 years of conflict or occupation. It's been there for that long. So we decided to do it there and to unveil the great plan that we were going to sell olive oil from Palestine into the UK. And so we gathered families across Palestine who came, well, across the district at least. <laughs> and in a room, there were 22 families had arrived, or farmers had arrived, come and meet us. And it was a good meeting. <laughs> Not an easy one, but it was a good one. And I'll tell you a little bit of the story of that. So their families had gathered, and we talked about where we, why we were going to sell the olive oil. And what we needed to do was to get the families to work as co-ops to stop trading against each other and form cooperatives. And by forming cooperatives, they would be able to meet trading standards. We'd be able to work out what EU regulations are up against. And we'd be able to work out how we could test quality and improve it. And so far, so good, right? Good plan? OK. So it was an awful plan. <laughs> And I, I will touch on why. Well, maybe it wasn't, but it's a journey. And this today is about a journey, right? We're learning. OK, so 22 f farmers had gathered in that room. And the local mayor said to me, do you, this plan you've got for us to trade together, not against each other, or use our separate routes. Some of these families get along really well. Some of them don't. 
but you're asking to create a business together. Can I ask the front row, if I just asked you to set a business up together, just because I've asked you, would you do it? <laughs> and that's really what I had to process, right? Why would they just do it, just because I said so? Um, I, asked, I was asked two questions at first by the mayor. Can you, if you were to bottle this oil, can you guarantee there's a market in the UK for it? And I thought about that for a while. And I thought, I'm keen not to mismanage expectations here. <laughs> uh, so my answer was no. You can't guarantee that. I said, okay, all right, you can't guarantee that. I said, but if we were to start pressing the oil together and stop trading against each other and work together to form these co-ops and share the money together, I said, could you guarantee you could bypass the wall when they built it? You guys have seen it. Can you guarantee you could bypass? You've seen more of it than we can because you can travel around Palestine. Palestine as an international. We can't. Can you guarantee you could bypass the wall with our product? And uh, I thought about that for a minute. I thought, well, oh, can't guarantee that. No. <laughs> okay. Then the third question got asked, which was, hmm, have you even sold olive oil before? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my answer was, no. no I, I had it. I hadn't, like I said, I hadn't tried it till I was at university. <laughs> I didn't even know it was good for you. <laughs> um, the, local, the local mayor, he was a bit, hmm. But more importantly, the oldest guy in the village was actually a quite a famous communist, and he sort of said, I don't have much, in Arabic, and it was funny for them, and I didn't understand it, but he said, uh, you know, I have very, very little faith in God these days, but I have even less faith in this guy. <laughs> no. and, and at that point, he left and everyone went with him. And I was sort of left, the language translation was one thing, but another thing, wow, what did I say? This is a great idea. <laughs> right? Come on. And they left. And I had to understand that. I think, wow, wow, why did they leave? Why, why did they leave? This is great. Uh, now, everyone left except for one person. And I really want you to see a picture of him. This is Tazir, Tazir Arabasi. He's a farmer in Palestine, and he'd lost all his olive trees. But that's not why he stayed. He stayed because he was our translator, and he couldn't leave. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but also, more importantly, he did believe in it. He looked at me and said, look, you don't want to mismanage them. I get that but they have gone through a million meetings like this with people with good intentions coming in and leaving. You've got to come in with some yeses. You don't get to just gather people as if your idea is the first idea they've ever heard. And as internationals with burgundy passports, you can change the world and that they are not the experts of this. They are the experts of this. This is the oldest olive farmers in the world. They're the masters of this. If we're talking about fair trade and trade justice, we're really talking about connection, right? And to learn from the people that make this stuff and show us how good it can be. We needed more yeses. And that wasn't easy. <laughs> but we went back, and we did get our butts kicked a bit, right? But we researched. We did a lot of research, a lot of thinking. What does it mean to do this? If we are going to be able to test this, we've got to work out how we can trade and pay families up front. If we're going to ask them to face settlements and armed settlers and militarization and risk their families against that space, they've got to know when they're picking that it matters and it's going to be sold. We can only do that by paying in advance. We've got to be excited about getting the organic certification. Why? Because you've seen these trees. Well, a bit of them. <laughs> Some of them are 800 years old. Some of them are 2,000. What? Who would use pesticides on any of those trees? So let's be excited by that. So we talked about it. There was a groundswell of thinking about it. And back in 2003 and 4, during that fever pitch, some of you remember one of the biggest things that was happening in the UK in 2003. Anyone remember what it was? Take a bold, you're in a safe space. Yeah, say again? Of Iraq, exactly. Invasion of Iraq, right? So in the invasion of Iraq, we had a million and a half people taken to the streets. And we used that space. We talked to people. We did the very first crowdsourcing before there was even a phrase. 
<laughs> and we used, there was no social media at that time, at least one that I knew about. Um, but we used, believe it or not, Yahoo groups. <laughs> and we emailed them and emailed and said, if you would be excited about supporting Palestinian livelihoods, would you be willing to pledge money? Um, and they did. And we had hundreds of people saying, yes, we would. And from there, we realized, oh, this might be a business. We could really pull this off. And then we asked the same group of people, those of you who made pledges, would you be willing to send checks and send us money <laughs> to pay for the oil in advance so we can pay farmers in advance? Uh, and you, surprisingly, they did. And from Yahoo groups and the anti-war movement, as well as just lovely people in women's institute and churches, we got 36,000 pounds. That was enough to fill a container. Incredible, right? They never met us before. And we had a business, we had capital. So we went back with some yeses. Um, and this is the team here, the original Zaytun team. We met with communities and we came back with more affirmative ideas of how we were going to do this. We made decisions with communities that could teach us. We worked with cooperatives that were being formed at the same time. Our Zaytuna was one of them. Canaan Oil, which is established now, and the Palestinian Fair Trade Association, that got created alongside while we were putting this action together. We came back with lots of yeses. It wasn't easy, but we did it. We created the first, and I think I've got it here, and um, I'm excited by this, but I'll tell you why it's not exciting. It's this, the worst, very first bottle of Palestinian olive oil to reach the UK, it's in my hands here. I'm excited by that, and that was 2004 when it reached the UK. I get excited by this bottle for lots of reasons. But you know, one of the silly things about it is it just says olive oil. <laughs> our brand is called Zaytun. We knew so little about business in those days, we didn't even write it on our bottle. <laughs> <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't occur to us. <laughs> we were so excited about getting a product through those checkpoints, through that wall, through villages. We just didn't even think about that. Um, we, we did, what we did know is that we had to move fast, and it mattered. We have to do things that I think could teach Pablo Escobar a thing or two about moving products. Uh, <laughs> to get every bottle of oil in, and you've got it in your hands, folks, yeah? to get every bottle of oil here, it, it, on its own is an act of resistance. But we have to do back-to-back -back loading. We have to get trucks that go from the West Bank, and it goes to another place uh, where it crosses those borders, and we have... Palestinians who live in Israel and Israelis who live in Israel consciously connect to it, who help unload it and go on roads that Palestinians can't use. And from there, we load it and we take it to ports. We're at the mercy of those ports, whether those ports are going to make this work or not. Some do, some don't. The only port that Palestine has that could work, anyone know where that is? I guess, by the sea? Can you say again? Gaza. Gaza, that's right. The only port that Palestine has is Gaza, and there is a 10-year embargo on there, and nothing can come in and out of there, and we can't use it either. Uh, we used to sell couscous from Gaza, and we've not been able to since this embargo happened, and it's a crime on its own. But we managed to get it out of ports, and that was exciting. Um, we also realized that there's such an appetite for this that we should go bigger. So we borrowed money from Tridos Bank and shared interests, really good institutions if you haven't come across them. And they get involved in this stuff. And we took the first shipment, and it arrived into the UK. And I want to say that that should be the end of the story, right? Because it just happened. But that's not what happened. We took that shipment, and when it did arrive, and I remember opening it, and two-thirds of the bottles were smashed. Mm, it's true. Uh, in fact, a glug of oil was swimming in our feet, and it was heartbreaking. It mattered so much to us. We had a lot of support. We had a lot of support from Brighton as well. Caroline Lucas was a big fan of, of getting behind this and putting some support to us, and she didn't know us that well. Um, but that was heartbreaking. And why am I telling you that? Because that was a point where we realized, we can't do this. This is too tough. How do we control to move a product coming out of a militarized place in the most famous occupation in the world where families themselves can't tell us what it costs to move it because they don't know day by day? Today, you might have a business, and you're used to living in Brighton, and you're used to trading, I don't know, in London. But then tomorrow, you can't do it. 
and then you realize the only way you can trade it with London is to really move right around London, perhaps even try to go through rumors that are happening that there's a place in Sutton that's open, and you're just going to have to keep trying. But then it turns out that rumor is exhausting to keep following it, and people give up. It was tough, but we needed to do it. Those bottles were smashed, and it wasn't easy. I'll tell you why they were. It's because it is weird and irresponsible to load up a container without pallets, right? Who, who, wouldn't, do that? <laughs> who wouldn't do that? But, but, but at the same time, Palestinians cannot trade and fill up an entire container. Nobody, uh, and again, we learned this the hard way. We're not commercial guys, right? Um, it is weird to fill up a container and transport it somewhere without filling it all. Why would you not fill it all? But we can't fill an entire container. Why? Because if the dogs, if military dogs cannot sniff and smell and jump over all of them, it won't go. The port won't let it go. The, the army will control that space, and it will be shut down. Even bottles. It is impossible for Palestinians to manufacture bottles. They're just not allowed to. They are a captured economy. Uh, so all bottles have to be shipped from Italy and Spain. Uh, that's not easy, but I'll touch on that story in a second. So we discovered these things the hard way, but we also knew in all the tiredness of it all that we had to keep trying. We had to keep trying because we didn't have, we got this far and the wall was getting bigger. We ended up with um, a lot of media behind the story. It got exciting. A lot of media. The Guardian newspaper called us the ethical oil barons, <laughs> which was nice, I suppose, for the Guardian. <laughs> um, and we had a lot of attention on it about how it was working, what was happening. We even ended up with uh, the New Statesman talking about it as raising a question, is this the most ethical product in the world? And that was fantastic. And we were inundated with more checks and more orders for the oil. So we decided to do another container. And it was worth doing. This time we were going to really get the game on <laughs> to know what we can load, how much we can load, and make sure that it gets here well. So second container arrived, uh, and we went to open it up. But it wasn't olive oil. In fact, that was a tough moment as well. What we <laughs> opened up, well, our entire container, it turned out, had gone to Bologna. Uh, and, and it's what I like to, because one country that probably doesn't need more olive oil, <laughs> it's, it's, it's Italy. So that really happened. It took us four months to trace that, bring it back. But then we were really sure we can't do this. Smarter people will come along to make this work, and they can learn from our mistakes, but it's not going to be us. And as we did it, we tracked it down, and we had Italians learning the story, thinking, wow, this is bold. This is amazing. We met French groups that said, can we replicate this? Can you show us how to do this? And we're like, well, don't learn from us. We're getting it wrong. <laughs> so, so we had South Africans saying, we'd like to try this. We had a group internationally sharing the knowledges. And every time someone said to us, oh, could you sell this here? Could you sell it there? We said, no, could you sell it there? See, we want to not exist. We want it to be so normalized that people aren't get, having to buy it. They could buy it themselves. It's familiar to them. We no longer stand in a room and say, who's tried Palestinian olive oil? And people go, oh, I don't know. So that's what we were up against. And it was a great moment to see that kind of solidarity and people getting behind it. Um, so we also got bolder. We improved a lot. We learned that we need to diversify, especially if the oil gets stuck. And it did. We got more containers, and they made it. We got more media attention, and it worked. And we had containers that we could track. And, it, and Palestine was teaching us what we needed to do. Families were teaching us what we needed to do. We um, diversified in different products. This is one of them. It's in my hands here. Um, it's really tasty, and I'll leave it outside, and you guys can try it if you want. Um, it is Zata. Um, anyone familiar watching Great British Bake Off recently? It was in the final, and they used Zata on their bread there. Oh, it was great. And what I really liked about it is no one asked or said, you had to explain it. You didn't have that poor guy saying, oh, this is Zata, right? It was, just, it was just a given. When we started, people hadn't heard of it. Now it's normal. Why we sell Zata is for a good reason. Some of the olive growers can take 20 years to make money from, really, you know, to grow trees once they've been destroyed. As I said, over a million trees were destroyed to make the wall. It's huge. 
So at Zata, we can grow herbs, and we can make an income for women's cooperatives, and we can do that in six months. It's not easy, but it's a start, and it keeps people going. And it allows us to talk about the heritage stories that Palestine still has. You know. So it grew, um, Dr. there, and it started to professionalize. There's Zata growing there, our boxes arriving. This is Basima, who came last year for Fair Trade Fortnight to talk about the story. And again, it's wonderful to have families that are able to tell the stories when visas are allowed and to get here. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Um, 2009 was a pinnacle year, right? Oh, because we created the world's first fair trade olive oil. It was a great moment for us. Do you know? It was a wonderful moment for us. Because I look at a bottle of olive oil, and I've got one in my hands, and you know, you guys have, hopefully now. <laughs> um, and I look at it, and I think a couple of things on this journey, where we've sold thousands of bottles of olive oil right, right across the country. Uh, and we have won soil association marks. We've won Best Taste Awards, not just because of the story, but because of the taste of it. Uh, as Neil said earlier, it became the world's first fair trade olive oil. And that is amazing for me, uh, that we took that story on. In fact, when we went to the Fair Trade Foundation and told them we want to do this in 2004, they said it can't be done. There's never been a fair trade olive oil. There's never been a fair trade product from Palestine. And there's never even been a fair trade product in the existing conflict. You know? So we're going to have to wait till this is over before we can get engaged. And we knew it wasn't going to get over. And so we said, look, we need to try and we need to work on that. Um, it happened. You know, it grew to that story. And I look at a bottle and I hold it in my hands, and you guys can do it right now, is all of these marks, they make a big difference. You know? They really are about connection and engagement. But the little you know, things that I think really matter is that behind every single bottle of olive oil, you know, there's a family. Oops. And it's a family that can trade. You know? It's a family that can sell, bypass the wall. It's a family still facing settlements. They're still facing militarization. But they're able to trade their products and tell their stories. These are stories that are in Oxfam and Sainsbury's, uh, Whole Foods. Um, it's in ethical superstores. You, know? you can buy Palestinian olive oil in shops that you could never see before. I still look at a bottle, you know what really excites me is the three little words on the back of the bottle. And I still find that incredible <laughs> in the journey. Because I hold up a bottle and I see product of Palestine. And it means it exists. And there are people there. And, it, and they matter. And it's that connection and engagement. So growing really from one village and a village that had a good reason to walk out and a good reason to be tired. The story has grown, you know, across the West Bank and across with support from Palestinian Fair Trade Association and, and cooperatives. We've grown this project. It's now 26 villages. It's now no longer just 22 farmers with disbelief. It's now over 6,000 families all being able to trade across into the UK. We've won lots of awards. We won Social Enterprise of the Year in 2015, and that's exciting for me. Um, even more exciting is we won Fair Trade International Award in 2016 in Bonn. We even beat Ben and Jerry's for that. That's, that's ice cream, right? <laughs> you know. So that's exciting. Um, and I think, you know, just sort of closing it a little bit, is it is a journey, but all good ideas are. Uh, they should frighten us. What are the ones that are worth doing if they don't frighten us a little bit? I think that, like all of you here, we, it's going to be a struggle. But you know the best ideas that we've ever had? All of you have had them. And why else would you be at the meeting, right, if you're not looking for them or creating them? But most good ideas, people always say, oh, I wish I'd thought of that 20 years ago. Or oh, where would I be now? Or I wish I'd done this sooner. And a good idea and a connection is like an, a tree. It's like planting a tree. Um, even an olive tree. And the best time to plant a, a tree is 20 years ago. Uh, the second best time is now. Thank you.